and so feel free to enjoy. Um, but I'm going to get started here. Um, hello. Hi. Thank, thank Hi you. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Dan Rosenberg. I'm the director of the Visiting Writers Series. And as always, I would like to start with um, thanking Miska, whose uh, funding makes these events and all the events that we do at the Visiting Writers Series possible. Um, and welcome to the launch of the 2018 Wells College Press Chapbook Prize winner, Negative Compass by Brett Shepard. It exists. <laughs> um, uh, before I get into the, the main event, I wanted to highlight something special that we've done this year. Um, this year marks the inaugural Bennett Prize, which is given to a single outstanding poem from among the chapbook contest's final <laughs> manuscripts. Um, the winner this year was Praise the Bird by Kim Lozano. Um, we were going over the finalists and discussing the, the merits of each manuscript, and though ultimately we came down on um, agreeing that um, Brett Shepard's manuscript was going to be the winner, the finalists were so incredibly strong, and um, so many of the readers had felt strong about this poem in particular that we thought, we'd like to sort of celebrate this, this work as well on this poet. So um, we decided that we would have this prize here. The prize is named in honor of Bruce Bennett, who is Professor Emeritus of English and the former director of the Book Arts Center at Wells College. And he is here, so I asked him if he would read the poem. So come, on, come on up, Bruce. Is this a good place to start? Can you hear me all right? Oh, it's nice not to read from a phone, but instead from an extremely wonderful broadside. Praise the bird. Praise the girl and her BB gun under the gray parade of clouds. Praise the elm at the yard's edge, the green model with wings. Praise the impulse and hesitation, the young hands and fail of eye. Praise the shot and every natural thing, the hollow bones and heavy fall. Praise the bird-strewn sky, the swelling throats, voices cryptic in their high-pitched talk. Praise the quiet room, the pale walls, the bed, and crying child. Praise the girl mirrored in the window, streaked with rain, thin ribbons of understanding. Praise the bird, its body grail a new weight upon the earth. And that's by Kim Lozano. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you so much, Bruce, and, uh, and to Kim Lozano as well. Thanks for giving us your work. Um, the other publication that we're celebrating is, of course, Fred Shepard's Negative Compass, and I just wanted to call your attention to how gorgeous this book actually is. Um, the frontispiece here is a wood engraving by Joanne Price that we commissioned specifically for this book. And everything about it, I think, indicates the sort of obsessive care that Wells College Press aspires to, to showcase in all of the work. Um, all this work that we do is built on a labor of love. And when we find great poetry, in particular, Wells has this unique ability to celebrate it, to make it even more beautiful, to put in a broadside, put in a chapbook, find a way to showcase what great writing looks like, and we get to share it with the world. It's a really spectacular thing that we can do here, and it's, um, it's rare. What we do here is actually very special, and, and it's a collaborative process, so I'd like to take a quick minute to extend my personal thanks to the folks here at Wells in particular who helped make these specific projects happen, including, um, where are you? There you are, Leah Mackin, our Victor Hammer fellow, um, the Bixlers, whose expertise is invaluable and whose letter foundry and press um, are just 
necessary resources to do the kind of work that we do. Um, Cooper, Arnie Blatter, and Bruce Bennett, and Becca Myers, and Shiloh McGiff, and all of the other screeners who helped me evaluate the 375 submissions we got for this contest, which was a lot of work. <laughs> um, at a certain point last year, I just started sending out SOSs to people, like qualified people who were also friends, who I could just ask on a dime to be like, hey, will you read 20 of these? <laughs> I need multiple eyes on all of them. Um, and most of all, finally, I'd like to thank Rich Kegler, who's the director of the Book Art Center, who's the devil goading me on in all of the most absurd and labor-intensive projects I take on here. Um, Rich generally makes projects like the production of this book and this broadside possible. So could we just take a minute and give him a round of applause? <laughs> to Brett Shepard, the star of the evening and this book. Um, I'm honored to be introducing a poet who I admire greatly and whose work just blew me away when I read it. Um, the poems in Negative Compass linger. They grow in the mind after you've read them once. I had to sit down and reflect after reading this book. And then thinking about it made me love it even more. And then I finally had some idea as to why. And I put some of them down in the forward to the book. So I'll share this brief forward with you and then um, get out of the way. In Robert Fagel's translation of the Odyssey, Odysseus is described as the man of twists and turns. The voice in Shepard's negative compass is also one of twists and turns, but this complexity is not a marker of cunning or cleverness. Rather, it's the articulated struggle to attend to the world honestly through language. Great poetry can work like a great translation. It estranges us from our own language so we can see its limits and its wonders anew. And what we see here in this book is how easily personal concerns slip into public ones, the intimacy of the ecological. Eco from the Greek meaning to manage one's household, Shepherd reminds us. And his poems offer an implicit argument that our household includes everything we encounter not just the I and the thou, the domestic space, but also field workers, rush hour traffic, the Inupiaq, also the Missouri River, a rotten backyard pine stump, fireworks that tempt the sky to empty itself of its stars. When all of human experience is part of our household, part of our self-identity, the bodily show begins to culture. And what grows in and from this culture is a hopeful vision because it shows us to be capable of extreme empathy, to see in a map the figure of the beloved, and thereby to love the whole of the land. Brett gave an excellent and engaging master class on great titles earlier today, and he sat with my poetry workshop as well, and throughout the day and the days preceding it when we got to know each other, I've been so happy to discover that the generosity of his poems is matched by the generosity and kindness of the man himself. I'm very excited to hear him read these poems, so please join me in welcoming Brett Shepard. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. And I was feeling nervous earlier because there was talk of, of karaoke later. And, uh, and I feel like to Becca, I oversold myself. And I was feeling very nervous, like, oh no, I cannot sing. At all. And now that introduction made me nervous because that's a big sell, and I don't know how much of it I can deliver, but I'll try. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here and spending time uh, with, with everybody. And, um, and I just want to thank Wells College um, at large for, for bringing me and really embracing um, this contest and the Book Arts Center. And it's, it's such a a really great thing to have connected to you outside of, of this community, right? Um, and I say that selfishly because now I feel like I'm somewhat connected to this, this place, right? And, like, and that's, that's great, right? The history of, of people that have been on this press, like Rich showed me uh, the, uh, uh, the William Carlos Williams book, The Clouds, that was out of here, right? Like that's, that's so amazing. And then to come here and see this beautiful chapbook, right? Now, not even, I'm not even talking about like the words,
It's a beautiful book. From the paper, like I'm kind of a paper nerd, and I'm like, I was talking to Rich yesterday, I'm like, this paper is really nice. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I have a chat book pressed with a friend, and we don't make books this beautiful uh, at all. We tape bind them, and, uh, and when we started doing it, we were like, oh, what if we tell people that it's like a book you can just kind of leave behind? <laughs> and uh, we're like, that's the, that, it looks like a book you can just leave behind. This does not look like that at all, and, and I'm so honored to have your work in, in this with me, and so thank you both for that, too. Um, and thank you to all of the readers. Bruce, I know, and I haven't met other readers who, who did this and, and, and other people from outside. Um, the work involved is just incredible, and I appreciate that, too. Um, and very special thanks to, to Becca and Dan for, for letting me stay with them and crash with them and play with Miles. Uh, and, you know, coming here, um, I was really excited, and, and I'm even more excited now because I feel like I've made at least two new friends, right? And that's great. And um, if you feel differently, please don't tell me. Just <laughs> silently block me on Facebook and we'll be fine. Uh, but but I, I, it's been such a great uh, pleasure to be here. So, so thank you to the entire community and, and everybody who's made this possible. Um, am I too close and loud to this? Is that okay? Okay. Jay, we good? All right. You can see where you karaoke. This is my problem. I don't, I don't know with the mic what to do. Uh, all right. So I wanted to start by reading, um, because I think poetry is such a conversation, I wanted to start by reading uh, a poem, a couple of poems. Uh, one from, from Dan's book, Cadabra, which is just a really, really beautiful book. I know, it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so it's just a really beautiful book, and these poems are so sharp and so precise, and, and, um, and they, they're in conversation with so many poets that I, I just admire and love, and this book is really part of that. And you know the poets I'm thinking of, too, right? Like, this is right up, you know, this is with Grant Faust and Robert Creeley and all this, but that just use language so, so well. Um, so, I'll just kind of go back and forth between poems and then maybe stop somewhere along the way for some questions and then uh, I'd like to selfishly read some new stuff as well that like I'm really conflicted about that I've had like really mixed responses from. <laughs> so maybe if you have any thoughts, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome them. So this is from Dan Rosenberg. Social networking. Evenings blotch into each other in the Arctic. You have far too many fingers in primitive light. What's the worth of touching when touching lands so feverishly on the populace? Like a snow globe, you make the world hard to see straight. This is from Native Compass. And it also mentions the Arctic, it's slightly different. Um, I grew up on the north side of Alaska and a couple villages up there. and. Uh, in what is the Nupiak area. And so a couple things here, I mentioned Ulu, which is just like a cutting device to cut like muktuk, like whale, whale meat, whale, whale bath, whatever. Um, Arctic interpreting. This is to say the language of the Inupiaq, to recall a way back to the silent earth, where slow waters run land, cold mapping the direction. This is north, there south, to taste that place, where braided streams feed people, where ice and ocean fracture boats, where bone and slate become the ulu. To say craft, to know the ulu's essence, to grip its blade and slice the thickest muktuk, the most tender eider, their meat over wild berries when summer arrives, somewhere near the Mead River. To listen to the flat land, the chill echoing the tundra in the brook's range, to wade through ice melt water, to let oil collect and reflect, to see it spread. So I write about place quite a bit, um, and one of the things that I've tried to do is not like think of, I write about this, and I've tried to think about writing about other, other topics and find a language for it that makes sense, and it's, it's difficult to do, and I was talking to Becca over coffee a couple of days ago, and um, I'd like to read one of, uh, this is Alicia Rebecca Myers, otherwise known as Becca, if you were wondering. Um, and so she, she writes in a way and finds a language for parenthood, specifically motherhood, and, and so much else that I just can't and don't have access to but want, and I just admire the poems in this book as well. So um, this is 24 Weeks by Becca. Cabin. To detach or give birth. So as to be both drift and manifold. 
the splinter inside the whirl. I pinch test my nipples to see if they lift away from the breast. Success! I do this while breaking coverage of the missing plane insists no wreckage. Imagine standing on a mountain and trying to spot a suitcase on the ground below. Then imagine doing it in complete darkness. Then imagine doing it with another's eyes, fused inside you. Not even recognizing your own body. I open my mouth to the fluted stem of the crepe myrtle, more in bloom because it was cut back, because it was cut. My friend is likewise hopeful in the pair of divorce. We are told to detach makes birth manageable. <clears throat> in that poem, Becca mentions manifold, and I really think that like poetic speech and poetic language, like what moves me or what I love about it is also what people resist. And so I wanted to kind of transition from that into a quote from Lee Young Lee, who is a poet, I think he lives in Chicago. And um, I actually like his like interview questions about poetry better than his poetry. Because uh, like he just answers them in a way where I'm like, yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you, man. So, <coughs> so here's just a brief quote from him, and then I'll get into some poems from, from Negative Compass. We know that not a lot of people read poetry because it's too dense. Poetry is dense because we as people are manifold in being. We have a physical body, an emotional body, a thought body, a soul, a spirit, and so on. At any moment in time, we are all of those things. So we are manifold in being. Often when we express ourselves, like when we buy bread, not all of ourselves is speaking. But poetic language is very dense because it is all of those levels speaking simultaneously and it's manifold in reference. That's how I recognize poetic speech. It doesn't sound the way we're talking now. We're talking very linearly and it's clear that one person is speaking to other people, but it feels to me that when a poem is very successful, the center of it keeps shifting and the audience isn't always clear. So, in these poems, I don't know if that if I, my stuff relates to that at all, I just like that quote. And thinking about why poetic speech is difficult and why it sort of is worth spending time in, because there's so much going on, and it's so different than like the language that we use in other things, right? And like, and I think I, I actually wouldn't want the language that I use in other contexts to be that public, right? Like I play fantasy football. I'm really obsessed lately about fantasy football because like our lead is blowing up. I wouldn't want our message board to be public. Like, that's terrible. It's a bunch of terrible things being said by people who I think are terrible friends. Um, <laughs> but there's something about poetic speech that kind of does gesture towards the public, even when it's private, and I kind of love it's because of this experience that we have that have, we have so little language for at times. And then what we're doing is trying to find this language. This is the first poem in the book, the chat book. Um, and I feel like in a way it kind of holds the other poems together. It's called Compass. Once, the entire world went dark when the sun set. No one found other bodies in the night. Everyone absented touch in winter. This made December the first metaphor for death. But not everyone died. They learned to start fires at night. Then the moon became the second metaphor for death. When under it, everyone learned to make love. There are a few compass poems in this book, and it kind of is a way to think not so much about how we use compasses to navigate the land, but trying to find language as a way to navigate our experience as people sometimes. Um, which, now that I just said that, sounds way too like high. It's not really like that, but, um, but I do want to read another compass poem. Compass. My arms rest on the rotten pine stump in my backyard. The rain again, and thunder in the distance. My feet wedge into the mud, hoodie clinging to my skin. I remove it and all my clothes. What am I here? Absent of anyone else, I must question how I know the material world. If the only thing I ever touch again is in this yard, I must question, question the nature of living. Though I have no exact way to say where I am, which is to say, know who I am, these words are the only map needed to find me. To know this place which is to say to know me, which is to say to know anyone. 
These materials must be stripped of their vocabulary, only to be reassembled by you and me together. True, this will be something similar to impossible. True, each thing exists in itself. True, the rain keeps streaming from the sky, keeps soaking into the ground, and keeps transpiring, only to fall once more. But following a negative compass toward the untrue, which one time this poem was actually re out, rejected by a, a, an editor, and his rejection was simply, "Yeah, I can't, I can't taste the grass is shaking, man." And I'm like, okay, "Fair enough." <laughs> Uh, all right, so maybe one last compass poem, and then I'd like to read some, some new stuff, and then I'll come back to this right at the end. So this title uh, is called Negative Compass, and this comes from, I, mean, I, told, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, I was in a theory class in grad school, and we were talking about, I believe it was Derrida, it might have been Foucault. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure it was Derrida because I started scribbling randomly nonsense. And uh, I remember going back to that journal, thinking about, like, much later. And I had written down this phrase, negative compass, and I don't know what it was in reference to, maybe trying to get out of that class or something, I'm not sure. But um, it became the title of this poem, uh, which I don't know, maybe has a loose relation to those, those thinkers, those theorists. Negative compass. Direction is silence beyond the gated forest, edging the field. We gate tonight, then stop. Or silence the meadow, then stop talking or unrest our legs and set ourselves a path along the creek bed. Then digest the matter of silence and the bowls. Pace slows the slow of speech, as in words form our geology. Then natural matter is as constructed as the rest. Or we are mountains, peaking above clouds, and we smell the fragrance of biology. Then insect cords make us dance. Or we erupt. Then night erupts, then silence is direction. So, just a transition. Are there any questions so far, by the way? Anything? There is. You can shut it out. If not, that's totally fine. So, I've been working on this new, sort of longish poem. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the reason that I wanted to read it was that, like, I've received some mixed, like, feedback from it. I feel like I'm going to talk about rejection again, and it's not like I'm focused on rejection, although that's like the right early thing. Uh, but there, I don't understand like the feedback. Like one journal that I submitted to you sent back, and like the editor was like, "Hey, this generated a lot of intense conversation, but we're going to have to pass." And I was like, "What was so intense? Like that was that you had to pass?" And then I, as part of uh, another manuscript, and was named a finalist for this thing, but the editor email back and was like, hey, I love some of the Emily Dickinson stuff you got going on, but some of those moments were just too cutesy. And I was like, what's cutesy? It's intense or cutesy? I really don't know what's happening right now because it's still early. And so I thought by reading it out loud, if you have any insight, I would welcome anything that you have to say about some of these sections. Uh, or nothing, if you're like, I'm going to be coming to town. Uh, so in general, a couple things about this poem. Um, it is kind of about how people intensify place and then we take people away. Um, the place is intensified in a different way. Um, so whether it's separation or death or breakup or whatever the case may be. Um, so it references Emily Dickinson. The title is called Boiling Sand. But I also reference... I reference Laura Jensen later. Has anybody, has anybody heard of Laura Jensen? She was a poet. Is a poet. And she's still alive. Uh, she went to Iowa in the 1970s. In the 1970s. She was a really big deal. And then, and I only know this story from a teacher named Brenda Holman who was there in the 1970s. And she had two books come out and they were really big deals in the 1970s. She was like the hot young poet that everybody was reading. And, and then the way that I heard the story was that she had sort of a breakdown um, and then just disappeared and stopped publishing. And she lives in Tacoma, Washington, which is where I live right now. And I've never met her. Uh, I would love to reach out, but I'm hesitant about reaching out. Uh, and so it just got me think. like, I love her work, um, and it got me thinking about the idea of disappearance and what happens when we take someone away. I mean, we still have her work, but, um, but she doesn't seem to be there anymore, and she's not publishing or writing anymore. So, so I take, I appropriate some of her language, basically, in this, in one of these poems. Boiling sand. Forty gone down together into the boiling sand, ring for the scant salvation. 
Emily Dickinson. One, a string of motion unplanned, particles streaming all at once into boil. At the beach, distant voices eddy to shore, turning each other's heads, long enough to see our home, enduring every flame we ever lit. Two, to add X to anything is violent, to X out. Dancing on the rooftops, you shouted at me to bring the anchor steam and a lighter. We watched the beach liquefy in places. We walked sand exploding in steps. Memory to wipe away the X like ash. Then to reseed. First sand, then fire, and then the boiling. Three. Surprise! The earthquake departed our clothes. Isn't that why we shared laundry? So as to identify, to smell like each other, to know who belongs and who is a monster, unwelcome in the sunlight, as if the ocean needs no identification to enter it, as if we danced on rooftops with enough intensity, the explosions of light became fireworks. Four, remember home, flooded bedrooms too. The abstract boils into the specific. Water sneaks up to a beach, and the driftwood reclaims itself for itself. Coral sand gestures to what we can't see, that we know so little of life. Glass sand is traced to garbage, that it reflects so much of us. Five. Remember our honeymoon from the ocean, the tide-like undressing small surprises in the window. So many waves full of sand, turning over silt, a destruction of uncorked eyes, a desirous look or two. Touch a sail. You said to be amazed even by moments we intend to have happen. Six. Edges of life on black sands beach, tethered the noise from your voice, streaming. Words like vapor steamed the cove. Isn't that why we pose bodies into photos, so as to bribe the future? We can be disappointed even by moments we want to be amazed. Nine, should music proceed from darkness when every beach is home to a midnight of thoughts? I took your missing bags to mean you caught the coastal train, the narrow chill when tracks opened, memories like veins. Thinking now, I park between moments of sunlight. Ten, I parked myself on the boiling sand below midnight, talking to social media. I saw pictures posted, you already gone. I took your new clothes to mean fire, Caught the first ticket to summer after it swept through downtown, the only bar we liked in Whiskey Flames. 13. Laura Jensen. But the bad boats are ready to be bad, to overturn in water, to demolish the swagger and the sway, to be guideless in the tide at night, that is true death. They are bad boats because they cannot wind their own rope or guide themselves neatly close to the wharf. Artists drowned to introduce the future to the past. 17. The brim of a sail too loose and then not in the distance of a boat. Water cuts. Over the edge, we found a sharper edge. The weekend trips to restart us. Episodes buffering into picture. Always in a hotel. You can find a monster beating the closet to enter another monster under the bed. 18. The water problem constitutes beauty from abandonment. In us, an electric charge revealed to point beneath a lighthouse. My body is a trampoline returning moments and waves. In a hotel, only negative reality approaches and escape from one another. TripAdvisor incorrectly stated the available amenities. 19. Circularity of thinking before thoughts boil in water. This poem as itself stands as like a palette. There are two types of distance, physical and mental. What do you call the room between them? It confesses lilies every morning. It curdles voices into pools we enter naked. I call it the middle of a cloud moving into horizon. 23. It terrifies me to dream of falling into the ocean without you, or vice versa, a reflection attenuated as a tire swing falling into the boiling sand. To speak of such aggression weaves scarcity into the vulgar waves. When one of us liberates the present moment, the monster fear of it, I think of sailing the tide backward to you. 24. 
If human beauty is capacity exceeded by event, isn't that why we steal each other's sense? To memorize our sense of each other? To think ourselves back to bodies? The bedroom drifts away on waves, the edges having burned any shore it touched. I tie myself to the bed frame to depart as the tide leaves and keeps leaving. So just to finish up with a couple of poems from me that compass. Um, I used to live in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles, does anybody live in Los Angeles? Anybody live in Los Angeles? Yeah? Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I always spent a little bit of time down there. Los Angeles is massive. It's so, so big. There's so many different personalities there. Um, and living there, it was really overwhelming, like an overwhelming experience. And if you don't ever leave Los Angeles, like, I think I spent maybe a year and a half never actually leaving the city. And then finally left, and I was like, oh my god, I could breathe. Like, it's, I'm missing so much. And I love Los Angeles, but. Um, there's so, so much about like status and it overwhelms you. And so looking back on my time living there, this was kind of the, the poem about Los Angeles that I felt about Los Angeles. Los Angeles. I was wrong to believe in planning, its false vision beneath shirt pockets. Morning's chores, writing and cooking, bring desperate hunger that freshens breakfast. The eggs taste more like grease from the bacon. The pan still scorched. After art, rush hour is more bearable at 8 a.m. The freeway full of status, car loans, and vanity plates. Traffic, accidents, traffic, police. A white-tailed deer, cousin of the circumpolar caribou, meanders across the 101 freeway, down from the West Hollywood Hills. Its antlers, and that I'm digesting a settler's breakfast, means this should be Alaska. Instead, industry wakes up. If I hear one more car horn, one more set of screeching tires, one more siren. I've been thinking about thinking about last love, but I start remembering too much. Out bad sides, out patchy dreams, endurance. It's to the point where all there is to do is circles, never running into something concrete. I'm there, an in-state, never crossing the border. So, this next poem, when I lived in Los Angeles, actually, my now wife, uh, broke up with me because I was like a lazy writer. Uh, and like, I don't mean I was writing like lazy poems, that's true. But like, all I wanted to do was like sit at the beach and like write poems. And she was like, okay, you clearly, <laughs> you clearly don't want to spend time. And so, so she broke up with me and, and she had every right to do so. We're, she's lovely, we're back together. Uh, but uh, I remember, and this poem was written long after that, but I remember when that happened, like being obsessed with social media. And like, we were still friends on social media. And so every time like a picture would come up of her with other people I didn't know, I created these stories. And I was like, who the, what? And, uh, <laughs> and it was just me creating these stories, right? And there was nothing there. But it was like me filling in this thing. And so this is kind of referencing that. But ultimately, this is just kind of a breakup poem. Oh, I can't believe that you're in love with that. <laughs> Musical weather and skin cramps, everyone's style. The barrier between, between me and you. The stereo cringes its tune to the room, and you sing back to the voice. For example, take me. Coffee, please. Two chairs not empty, like two chairs empty. You tell me, I'll understand. My hand runs across the lacquered tabletop. Its print fades so slowly I watch the whole of it. It's been a while. Think about math and calculus that long. Description, you say, is inaccurate. Your hair looks exactly like the remains of the past I buried, rot. Your face becomes that other person's problem to devote. I sit at the table and want to believe you're here. Disgust and company kept. Take me, for example. I've never told my wife that I don't know. I hope she ever finds that, too. Um, so, to close out, I'd like to read one more poem, one last poem. Um, and again, before I do, just thank you to Dan, Becca, Rich, Leah, 
Bruce, everybody here. It's been such an incredible couple of days getting to know this community and getting to know everybody here. So uh, thank you so much. I really, truly appreciate the book, which is beautiful, but also the time to come here and meet so many of you. Living as magnets. The mood of the oven. Plastic is more than plastic when it burns. Did we design this room to smell of plastic? The open floor plan circles us into each other. And who cares? And who suffocates? Fields suffocate as snowfall pulls our bodies outside. It shouldn't be shameful to breathe. Wheat stubble crunches as feet sink into snow. The ground pulls us. For as long as I can remember, the ground has been pulling us, as if iron laced our bones, promising last breaths. A few last clear breaths. Thank you. I think if, you, if you're willing to take a few questions, if we have... Yeah, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the poems, my fantasy football team, whatever. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about uh, the, submitting the, the poem and, uh, yeah. and the comments on them. And you use the word of something like a, a disappearance or something like that. Yeah, like when you take someone away from a place, then like the, right. it changes. And I was, it's very kind of odd because Emily Dickinson never existed until she came after she had gone. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like there were there were less than ten fewer than ten poems in her lifetime actually in print somewhere. Yeah. 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 And that's that's and her existence of the world was very static too. She barely left home. She barely sort of but she loved her garden and um, her letters were her sort of extension out into the world too. Um, but people were somewhat absent from her actual physical daily life, which is fascinating too. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Do you ever want to go back to Los Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. I would go back to Los Angeles. We have two kids now, though, four and one, and so it's kind of like, I don't know what that would look like, but like 24-year-old me wants to, like, yeah, like it'd be, yeah, it'd be fun, but like now, I don't know. So I don't know. If we could afford it, like if we had like a huge surplus of money to buy like a great, like maybe, but I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like Don Henley said. And what's that? It's like Don Henley said about Los Angeles. About is that the Hotel California? Yeah, you can check out any time you like. <laughs> you could never leave. Yeah, that's true. It still comes up a lot in my work, for sure. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a couple technical points you could ask for things like that on your own. Sure. Uh, yeah. That I'm not sure anything ever eddies to shore. I think eddies simply spin around in, in a place. Okay. Yeah. And you never have boiling sand at midnight. I'm, I'm sure you spend enough time on the beach to know that you can walk across the sand in the morning and it's really cold. Yes. And then the sun comes out. Yeah. And it's scorching hot. Yes. Yeah. 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 I've been so I've been thinking about boiling sand, but like there is a phenomenon of boiling sand. There is that idea of yeah, of sand being too hot too. So that the Eddie to short thing is definitely something I'll have to go back and, and change. But I'm thinking of the boiling sand and, and trying to think of it in a few different ways like that too. So that's a good, that's a really interesting point. Thank you for that. I actually just want to ask you what part of Alaska you're from. I'm from Fairbanks. Oh, are you really? <laughs> oh, I grew up in Barrow, Alaska. Oh my gosh. And then Akasuk, Alaska, which is like in a smaller village near Barrow. Oh. Yeah, and then I went in Anchorage a little bit too. Okay. But yeah, 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 from Fairbanks, yeah. I love Alaska. Alaska's great. I, I, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, can your question actually made me, or, or your idea of the pulling sand, made me think of poet Bianca Stone. Do you know Bianca? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, she yeah. does like illustrations too. She did some illustrations for a chat book we did. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah she's yeah. incredibly talented. Yeah. Her grandmother was Ruth Stone, so there's kind of a lineage of poetry. Right. She recently got criticized in a review for language that wasn't exact, meaning that um, she sort of also used maybe scientific language or things that refer to a phenomena that couldn't exist. And she wrote this really beautiful kind of rebuttal that was like, well, sand can boil for me at midnight, that kind of thing. Um, not that your advice isn't, isn't on, you know. But, but I think yeah. there's two different ways to look at that, because you can read it from a very 
sand doesn't literally do this at night, or you can say, my experience was that it boiled at midnight. So I think there's two ways. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think that's a good point. The, but I think the short thing is me just needing to do some more research on this. The boiling sand thing, I am thinking about how there can be like a figurative boiling of like something going on when you take someone away, right? Um, but I also, I do want it to work, too. I want it to not breathe as like and, a mistake. And finding that balance is really the trick, yeah, right? Yeah. Because you have to account for all kinds of interpretation. Yeah, yeah you don't want it to be a mistake. Or exactly. sound like a mistake, exactly. right? I mean, we talked about this a little bit, too, with translation. So you don't want it to sound like a mistake, but you also want to have possibility in it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 My question is about why, why did you come up with this idea? How were you were inspired by it? Why did it take you to grab Which idea, sorry? The, the idea of boiling sand. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a mysterious process. Like, when you, when you look at boiling sand, there's part of the process that, like, doesn't really happen the way, like, on a beach with sand. It's some other thing. And, like, initially, I was just, I'm still trying to find what works. Because initially, I was thinking about waves, like sound waves and like waves coming in, and then the idea of, of things, of sand which can be so peaceful and calm, but then also can, there's these, these moments that can happen where something more happens, and when, when does something more happen? And thinking about how in nature that can happen, but I also think it happens with people, that oftentimes we go about our daily lives until something more happens, and I'm, I'm trying to make sense of that something more a little bit, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. That's kind of like, yeah, it's yeah. Oh, yeah. Isn't that part of the epigraph? The Emily Dickinson? Boiling sand comes from a poem, so that is part of the epigraph. Yeah, I mean, and that's so, what you're, you're using, I mean, probably because, I mean, largely because she, you take off from Yeah, that's the jumping point, was, was finding that in a poem and then thinking about how. I said this earlier, too. Like, when I'm stuck, Emily Dickinson is where I go. And so, like, it was kind of being stuck in this poem and trying to figure out how to get unstuck with it. Um, like, stealing, like, the title from the poem, Place Where Presence Was, which I didn't read that, but, like, um, that's just ripped off from everything. So, right? yeah. I think uh, people would also be interested in the process of putting together the chapbook. Was this a chapbook for a while, or did it gradually gather and accrue? It, yeah, actually, this is one of the first times I sent this chapbook out, actually. Uh, there was like a loose version, previous version. But this is part of a full length, and so I took a lot out and tried to, I used it as a way to sort of understand how the full length was working and to see sort of how the sequence was going and then adjust kind of the first section of the full length. So a lot of this is like, this is probably, I don't know, 60% of that for like the first part of the full length, but rearranged as a way to order it. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of liking how this works. And, I think I will submit it and see what happens. And so it was kind of like, okay. Um, and then, like, just got super lucky. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But just trying things and seeing how they work. And, like, then going away from it and then reading it out loud. And then, like, you know, putting them out there and just seeing what they look like, what would happen if things changed. Like, it's a really, like, insular process to sort of figure this out. Unless you bring in other people and talk to people. In which case, that just confuses things even more. <laughs> So it's yeah, but it gets a life of its own as it comes together and yeah. talks to poems talk to each other. Yeah, exactly. Revisions happen that way. Other things come up that way. Yeah, yeah. So while we're on process, I kind of want to pull a bunch of things, try and pull a bunch of things together. Um, listening to you read, um, I'm struck by how you're weaving the sort of the abstract and the theoretical in with a moment or an image that might ground it. And in one of your poems, you write about um, what you call the room between. Right? Oh, yeah. And I see so many of your poems as doing this kind of mediation. Um, I'm wondering where, even negative compass with its reference could possibly bear it up. Um, yeah. I'm wondering how, where the process starts for you. Does it start in a grounded image? Does it start with abstraction? Um, could it be both or either? Is it a feeling? Where, does that, where, where are these poems coming from for you? Yeah, I think the ideas are always an abstraction first, and then whenever it starts to kind of work is when I find an image for it. Um, in Dan's workshop, we're talking about this a little bit too. Um, and, I, and for me, it's thinking about an idea or like an emotion, and, and, I, and trying to find something that gives kind of a, like a concrete sense of what that is. 
um, not just for the poem so much, but uh, like for me too, trying to figure that out um, and come up upon something like that it confesses lilies every morning. Where if like if I had to explain that image, that line, I probably would struggle to explain what that means. And yet to myself, I kind of know what it means. And like there's no other language for I think images sometimes other than the image that's there and then sort of what it communicates. And I guess I'm kind of in an ideal world looking for some of those moments to like. This is the language, the only language I could find to express this thing in this image, and I can't really say it in a different way. And some of them strike me as problem solving, right? As you mediate back and forth during hunting time, I do find sometimes when I look back that like I'm, I do answer things or try to answer things, and then I, do, I also kind of try to resist that times because it feels like who am I? Like <laughs> I answer this? I don't know. I guess as long as it sounds okay, but like yeah, but I'm, I'm not always sure how committed I am to. Yeah. I'm thinking, having just spent, you know, the, the sort of time with this, with your manuscript that I usually would only spend with my own, <laughs> um, yeah. um, I, like, a thing that stood out to me, and even in your bio stood out, is, is how committed to specific places you are. Like, in, yeah. in your bio, you actually, like, list many of the places that you've lived just as a sort of... Frame. And I was thinking about how important location seems to be in so many of these poems. And I was just wondering if that is that an obsession that you discover in, in your own work? Is that something that's unique to this collection? Like, what, what do you think the function of, of place is in, in your poems? If that's not too huge of a question. No, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what the function is, but it is location. Like, I think it is for me location, location, location. Where I'm trying to like figure out like. I think back to like Alaska and like I don't ever get back to like the villages of Alaska. And social media, like I connect, but like Barrow, Alaska, where I'm from, they recently just changed their name. They just had like um, my generation who are like, you know, of, of my new guy friends when they changed the name to Ukiaki instead of Barrow, because Barrow is the last name of the friend of the guy who played like the white guy who stumbled in and found it. And so they're like, why are we going by Barrow? And I'm like, I'm not there for this. And so I feel, even though I'm never probably gonna write a poem about that. Um, I still feel like I want, I, I just, I can't escape these places like Los Angeles, which I love, right? Like, it was so influential on, for me. Um, and I feel like I get to know a place that way, too. Um, I'm not quite sure why I can't get out of that. Um, but, like, even in, like, grad school, like, my teacher, like, this poet, Grand Faust, kept, like, just saying, hey, you like this person, he's from Los Angeles. And, like, eventually it was just like, oh, they're a poet in Los Angeles, that's, you might like them. As opposed to, like, their work. And so, I don't know, but yeah, it's, I do feel connected to certain places. If you stay longer in Aurora, you'll feel that way. I try. For her, it's great. I walked down, I was like, hey, this is super. I think Dan told me the story about having wine on your dock. I'm like, oh, I want a dock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>
Thank you all so much, and I hope to see you next week. Have a great night.